Good morning and welcome to today's technical webinar sponsored by NTMDT, your ramen and AFM company. Today we're very privileged to have Dr. Virgil Elings and Dr. Sergei Maganov uh, presenting information about our new hybrid AFM mode, your path to understanding forces for precise material properties. Um, our presenters really need no introduction. Uh, however, Dr. Virgil Elings received a doctorate in physics from MIT and holds more than 40 patents. Virgil is a leading entrepreneur in nanotechnology, a devout ed educator, and a UCSB professor of physics for more than 20 years. In 1987, he co-founded Digital Instruments in Santa Barbara, bringing one of the first commercially available scanning probe microscopes to the scientific community. Dr. Maganov received his doctorate in physics and mathematics from the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. Sergey has published over 200 peer-reviewed papers, one book, 15 book chapters, and is now CEO of NTMDT Development, an R&D subsidiary that was established for the development of novel experimental and applications capabilities using NTMDT microscopes. Today, Virgil is going to present his perspective on how scanning probe microscopes were developed and how some of the modes that we're very familiar with uh, came into being. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Virgil. Thanks, glad to be here. I want to do a little bit of history with the emphasis on how innovation uh, comes about in strange ways, not only by trying things that you think should work, but trying things that you don't think should work. And then also, once you are trying things, keep your eyes open and see what uh, what is really happening. Let's go way back. Way back is 1972. Here's an article in the Review of Scientific Instruments, which in fact I never read until way into the 90s after we'd been making microscopes for quite a while. But look at this thing. It's got a uh, metallic tip. It's got a metallic sample. It's got a piezo scanner. A current comes uh, out of the sample and is used for feedback in the uh, Z direction on the tip. And this thing scans and makes an image. It's, it's exactly what all of us were making and calling them air STMs. This is seven years before any of uh, publications by Binnig and Rohr, even in, internally to uh, IBM. These people wanted to uh, do a non-contact scanner. And what they wanted to do was field emission. They would hold the probe up from the sample, put it in a vacuum so that they didn't weld the tip to the, to the sample, and then put a fairly high bias voltage on this thing and a fairly high current and scan along doing field emission. They had a big emphasis on non-contact and uh, I claim that may have done them in a little bit. They did mention, though, it'd be nice to do imaging on an atomic level. They talked about tunneling, but had done some calculations and said that if they went down and did tunneling uh, at very low voltages between the tip and the sample, as that this, with the tip so close to the sample that the stability would be such that they couldn't handle it. So as far as I can tell, they never tried it. What they didn't do was to go ahead and try it anyway, because what they would have ended up with, as you can see from their diagram, is exactly what people built in the late 80s and 90s and called them air STMs. They would have got incredible resolution. Uh, all they had to do was get rid of the vacuum, get rid of the high bias voltage, get rid of the high uh, tip to sample current and go along. And what I believe in retrospect is that all these great air STMs we were building were really contact microscopes in which the current between the tip and the sample was really conductivity. And that's what these people would have got. And instead, they continue with field emission, and then the research died. We made uh, scanning tunneling microscopes, which again, I believe are really contact microscopes. One of the problems 
we always had was the tip would wear away. Here's a non-contact instrument in which the tip kept wearing away all the time, no matter how we turn the feedback gain up or any of that. And so when we got to big scans, we did something called the jumping probe microscope, where instead of having the tip scan along, which we thought was above the sample, we would jump the probe and it would jump up, come down, get a detect a tunneling current, and then jump back up again. We were probably a little bit naive on thinking the tip somehow would come down and not hit the surface, but hey, we we're making tunneling microscopes. We also pointed out how you could do this with an atomic force microscope by keeping track of the deflection of the cantilever as you come down to the sample. Uh, watching uh, the interaction between the tip of the sample and then and then keeping track of the deflection of the cantilever as you pull the tip off the sample. We made this and uh, in the tunneling microscope, it's in fact on large scans the tip uh, quit wearing down, but the tunneling microscope was dying at the time and being replaced by the atomic force microscope. Again, uh, my feeling in retrospect is that these things we were making in air is the microscope on the left, which I'll call a scanning touching microscope, STM for short, uh, in which the current between the sample and the probe is conductivity. And then here's a scanning tunneling microscope, STM for short, of course, uh, which is what people felt they were doing in air. It turns out these instruments are exactly the same in their build, in their operation, and the only difference I can tell is that the operator thinks one is tunneling and the other one thinks it's doing conductivity. So the atomic force microscope, a great invention actually, uh, came about in 86. The idea was to have a very sensitive cantilever in which the force on the sample would be of the order of the force holding atoms in the surface, hence the name atomic force microscope. And the way to sense the cantilever was this non-contact STM tip that you would hold above the cantilever and do this. Well, people tried this and built this and it, and it didn't work. Oh, it worked, but the forces between the tip and the sample were of the order of a hundred times atomic force. And of course, in retrospect, my belief is, of course, that this STM is not non-contact. It was basically pushing on the back of the cantilever in air. And uh, this is a, sort of a nasty way to uh, do, determine the deflection of the cantilever. It was replaced by an optical lever, which was done at both UCSB and at IBM. But then again, uh, here's a diagram from 19 1929 of an optical beam on a cantilever, which the beam then goes to photographic film. So maybe there was nothing new in uh, detecting the motion of a cantilever. So we did the AFMs for a while, and in a in a uh, venture with IBM, they want us to build a large sample stage that did non-contact. Uh, a idea that was invented at IBM where you bring the, an oscillating tip down near the surface and you can detect the shift basically in the resonant frequency due to the attractive van der Waals force. The idea is shown on the bottom of this diagram is if you operate on the high side of the resonance curve that as you lower the tip down and the van der Waals force lowers the resonant frequency of the cantilever, the amplitude of oscillation goes down as shown uh, in the red and blue curve down from the black curve. And so you can use this as feedback when you come down to the surface, the amplitude will go down and then you can use that to feedback how far above the surface you should stay. We tried that and it worked easy. Which surprised me because when I read the literature, it looked like people were having a tough time doing doing this thing called non-contact. And then one day somebody walked into my office and said, well, you know that non-contact is really easy. It works uh, if you sit on either side of resonance or on top of resonance. You can sit wherever you want. I, I said, no, that's impossible. You can't do that. 
Well, we found out that the oscillation amplitude was hundreds of nanometers, not a nanometer. And it was clear what was going on as you bring the tip down to the surface, the amplitude goes down because you're banging into the surface. Now, <clears throat> offhand, if we didn't have any data, we would say, no, 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 we don't want to do that. That's what IBM said, by the way. No, 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 you don't want to do that. You want to do non-contact. But we had a bunch of data already, and uh, the data indicated uh, hitting the surface is not bad. Here, let me show you a few images in the, in the contact AFM mode. We would scan uh, silicon wafers. It was a fairly big part of our business at one time. And the problem is if you do a small scan and zoom out, look at, look at what you got there. You've been plowing away on the silicon wafer. And then we did the same thing with what we thought was non-contact at the time. And you zoom out and notice that you can't even tell we were there. So we had data that would indicate this isn't what we want, but it's not bad. In fact, it's quite good. And even in retrospect, it turns out it's better than the non-contact. It's better in the sense that later came phase images, which are sort of a measure of the energy dissipation of the tip hitting the surface of the sample. And if, if we wouldn't have been hitting the surface of the sample, we, there are a lot of phase images that we would have never got. By the way, any of you who feel that you're doing the non-contact mode vary the uh, operating frequency of uh, the oscillation of the cantilever around across resonance. And if your scanning works on both sides of resonance, then you should probably change your idea about what you're doing. Oh, the lightning striking twice. It's, it's this emphasis on non-contact, which, which in both these cases I think didn't work out that well. It turns out if, if Young would have went down and did tried to do a tunneling microscope, they probably would have found out that they were doing conductivity. But nonetheless, if they would have given up this idea about non-contact, they would have made a really high resolution microscope back in 1972. And it probably would have uh, changed history a little bit. But also on the atomic force microscope, this emphasis on non-contact, uh, contact wasn't bad. And it's easy. Hitting the surface is the easy way to change the amplitude of the, of the cantilever. So in both cases, uh, this emphasis on non-contact uh, was an emphasis one didn't need. Here's some, uh, some sayings by a wise philosopher, which has a lot to do with sometimes what I think about uh, predicting what direction things are going. So what's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion, as I already mentioned, is that innovation is really not something of just thinking about something and then having it work out, but it may turn out to be trying things that you don't think will work, which is Young's problem. They, they decided that they couldn't do tunneling, so they didn't try it. Well, they wouldn't have got tunneling, but boy, they would have certainly got something better than what they were trying to get. And then keep your eyes open. and even if it's by accident, which, which you could argue was the case when, when we were doing tapping, is that our eyes were opened in the sense that we we figured out what's really going on. And it turns out, again, what was really going on was actually, in retrospect, better than what we were trying to uh, get to happen. So let me turn this over to Sergey, who will talk about current day innovation. Dear webinar attendees, it's my pleasure and honor to continue our discussion of atomic force microscopy and its application 
following the retrospective of the developments of this technique given by Dr. Virgil Eddings. As seen uh, from the agenda of my talk, first I will focus uh, on the recent improvement microscopes made by NTMDT, whose uh, research and development division in the United States I'm representing. Afterwards, I will describe the novel hybrid mode, which is now a routine options of this microscope and provide its rational comparison with amplitude modulation mode. Contemporary atomic force microscopy is implemented in different modes. In DC contact mode, uh, the cantilever deflection is monitored and used for the feedback. In the oscillatory amplitude modulation mode, the changes of amplitude, frequency, and phase of interacting probe at its resonance frequency are detected. In the novel hybrid mode, we are employing the probe deflection, which is a contact mode feature, but during oscillatory intermittent tip sample contact at frequency lower than the scanner and probe resonances. The playground of these modes is uh, presented by a circle of application on the right side. The progress in IFM instrumentation is related to a large part with improvements of electronic controller, controllers and in our next and in Integra instruments the noise in detection of probe amplitude in amplitude modulation mode is down to 25 femtometers over square root of hertz and noise of high voltage is below 1 millivolt over the 600 volt range. Plus, we introduce the larger number of lock-in to our systems uh, in order to enable the multi-frequency electric piezo response and mechanical study in uh, IFM uh, related modes, in, in uh, amplitude modulation related modes and in resonance related modes. Uh, also, we are recently adding the high speed acquisition and processing model, which makes possible the hybrid mode, which I will describe later, and all other innovation capabilities. Uh, the uh, Advantages of the low uh, noise imaging come in atomic uh, molecular resolution uh, studies, which I uh, illustrate by the examples on this slide, where we see the uh, atomic scale lattices, the calcite crystals in water, which were obtained with very low amplitude, which uh, is possible to do with our instruments also. In the measurements in air, I will show the examples of uh, molecular scale images of ttft q crystal, which is the first synthetic organic conductor, and also the chains of the uh, Teflon, which were deposited on silicon substrate just by rubbing these materials. All these structures, all these images show the uh, sub-nanometer uh, resolution with the uh, number of details. Also, I, uh, I want to say that the advancement in the sub-nanometer uh, or in, in the imaging and amplitude and other resonance mode with sub-nanometer uh, amplitudes is uh, advanced by uh, Dr. Yamada in Kyoto and his followers and this actually make really the, uh, the chase in the uh, atomic scale imaging uh, with AFM, and I think there are a lot of uh, things to come in this area. But we'll go further, and I will show you what advantages you can get by adding the uh, uh, multi, uh, multiple uh, locking amplifiers to the system, and that's particularly in the single pass images, uh, single pass operation, the Kelvin mode uh, and other electric modes. Here we have the scheme. Uh, we are showing that if we watch for the uh, interactions at different resonances, then we can follow the, the effects of the different force which kill simul simul simultaneously uh, act between the tip and the sample. And in the case of the electrostatic uh, force interaction, you promote that by the uh, applying the voltage to this uh, cantilever and this bias, DC and AC bias, and then uh, we can get information uh, at lower 
uh, frequencies at which we apply that uh, about the surface potential DCDZ while the system using the mechanical resonance for scanning and tracking the topography. And there are some equations describing these electrostatic forces also. I want to say that we can uh, in, uh, detect the uh, electrostatic interaction by amplitude modulation or phase modulation modes, depending how you set your uh, lock-in amplifiers. And advantages of single pass Kellen force microscopy and other electric measurements versus double pass. First of all, we do faster imaging. We don't need to make two scans. And second, because during the electrostatic measurements, our tip is in immediate vicinity of the surface, then we have better uh, sensitivity and special resolution. And I will demonstrate that feature by the following slides, where we see the data obtained on the fluoroalkanes. This is uh, molecules which consist of the uh, covalently bound fluorinated and hydrogenated parts into single chain molecule. And in this chain molecule, the the uh, dipole is also aligned along the chain. Therefore, when the self-assemblies of these fluoral canes on silicon are formed in the way that the molecules are preferentially oriented vertically, then you have a strong surface potential on particular self-assemblies, as you see in the surface potential image. All other contamination where there is no such alignment of the molecules, you can still observe in the height image and also in DC, DC image. And this shows that this kind of independent, uh, simultaneous but independent measurements of these um, uh, features. Also, if you put the same molecules on the uh, graphite, then in the first layer, the molecule oriented uh, laterally, it means that the dipole moment will be. Uh, mostly in the uh, plane uh, orientation. Therefore, the, uh, you still see surface potential variation, but the, um, the, they will be not very strong. The surface potential variation will not be strong. But it's important then if you go to this lamella uh, layers and just zoom in and get the 80 nanometer area in the surface potential image, you see the variation which show that there are small molecular uh, dipole, dipole contribution from the fluorinated uh, n-group, CF3 groups, which are not completely lying along the plane and there are some vertical component and we start to see that and these strips formed by the n-groups, CF3 n-groups is a couple of nanometers and that's uh, really showing that we can get extremely high uh, special resolution in these measurements. Uh, now we are uh, coming directly to the hybrid mode. Uh, which is kind of the essence of my presentation. And uh, here I want to say that that uh, this mode, uh, which is a little bit described by Virgil Ellings, was uh, based on the fact that the intermittent tip sample, uh, the oscillatory motion of the, let's say, of the substrate brings the uh, sample in the intermittent contact with the cantilever and cause it bending. And that's happening at the resonance frequency much lower than the resonances of both the sample, uh, the probe and the scanner. This kind of approach brings people attention for a long time. And you see there are some predecessors. There are the stylus profiler uh, featuring the insulating probe in 1955. And this also the patent on the jumping probe microscope by Virgil Ehring and Gus Gurley, which is uh, originated in 1989. Uh, uh, also, there are some implementation of the, the same idea in different commercial modes. I listed some of them. However, we don't need particular details how the people are doing. But the basic motivation for all these measurements has two things. First things, due to uh, intermittent contact, uh, to reduce the tip sample shearing information, just to, redu to reduce the potential damage of the uh, tip and the sample. And the second, because the cantilever deflection is more directly related to the forces then, that may be much easier to, to record the uh, different properties related with the deformation and with force measurements. Indeed, if you consider the uh, temporal deflection plot, which uh, people which we obtain in this particular mode when the uh, sample uh, oscillated at 
frequency in the range between 0.5 to 3 uh, kilohertz. That's uh, show as following. On this point one, where the tip is far from the sample, we have a kind of baseline, but this baseline can have also sensitivity to long distance interaction like electrostatic or magnetic. As then the tip approaching the sample, then there can be slight uh, attractive interaction at point two, and then the deflection going up, it means you go to repulsive forces until, let's say, the set point um, uh, deflection uh, reached, and this is 3.3, .3, and then uh, if you continue the cycle to the end, then uh, you go to the remote position and tip uh, position 5, and you're going through adhesive well at point 4. That means there is a lot of these features, particularly you say you can talk about the stiffness looking on the slopes of loading and unloading passes, also this adhesive well into point 2 and point 4, and also the baseline. Everything can be served, can be used for detect the local properties. For example, watching the baseline, we can get idea about the long distance electrostatic forces. Uh, looking on the slopes, loading and loading slopes, we can get idea about local mechanical properties. Looking on the wells adhesive properties. Plus, during the time the touching just around the point three, you can independently measure current sensing or current between the tip and the samples if we apply bias voltage, or you can do piezo response measurements, but that you have variety of the information. However, to get that information, you need fast de uh, deflection uh, collection, fast de deflection acquisition, plus you need to do a lot of processing because not uh, all uh, probe responses as good as this one showed on the left, and the, uh, that's we can succeed to do with this uh, new additional model because we can, for example, use also wavelet filtering to reduce the uh, ringing noise on the soft cantilevers or hydrodynamic noise, in the, particularly in the work in the liquid, and then we'll get idealized and improved curves, which we can different part of this curve can be. Uh, used for mapping of different properties. And I will show uh, illustration of this application uh, going to, for example, sensing long distance forces hybrid mode. That show on the top images we have images uh, height and base uh, line maps for the two uh, data storage units, hard disk and its old companion, zip disk. In both cases, height showing the kind of topography of the samples, whereas baseline maps reflect the magnetic structure of these uh, objects. Uh, of course, in this case, we're using the uh, probe which has a ferromagnetic coating to have this uh, sensitivity to magnetic forces. In the case of we, if we use conductive probe, then we can go and uh, try to uh, get the electrostatic measurements on some of the objects, and one object shown uh, below. This is the carbon nanotubes which spread on the uh, silicon substrate. In this case, if you uh, increase the bias voltage, you see the signal uh, appeared very strong in baseline, which reflect the uh, surface potential changes on the surface, in particular on the uh, nano. Uh, carbon nanotubes. Therefore, baseline variation reflect the variation along distance magnetic and reactive forces. If we uh, can continue and use the same sample of, of uh, nanotubes on silicon substrate, we will also demonstrate the current imaging in the hybrid mode. In this case, we are simultaneously getting height, stiffness, adhesion, and current maps. In the current maps, we see that only selective carbon nanotubes provide the conductivity contrast and the stiffness and adhesion, they reflect some local mechanical uh, properties related with the uh, substrate and the carbon tubes uh, deposited on. Also, it's important then in the uh, current imaging maps, we see that the current is varied even along the single nanotubes. That's what reflects its very complex conductive and sometimes semiconductive lo local behavior of these objects. Now. Uh, we will go and see what was really unexpectedly, you see, that's kind of follow the, the ideas of the Virgil talk that we should uh, live with open eyes whenever we do, because you can find something. Saying, this was quite unexpectedly for me that if you start to look at the objects like uh, polyethylene, 
uh, materials and polyethylene is the most known and most uh, common polymer. And uh, depending on the structure of this uh, chain molecule that can be completely linear, it can be branched. There are different type of uh, lamella structures and different content of the lamella structures in this semi-crystalline polymer form. And the, doing measurements in ambient modulation, the hybrid uh, mode, we get the height images which show in here. And it's clear that for LLDPE, linear low density polyethylene and low density polyethylene, in both cases, if we go and do imaging two modes, height images in the hybrid mode shows much better contrast between the, uh, which is related with the fact that there are amorphous and, and, and lamella structures which are more rigid in this system. The same is for, for another uh, two polyethylene. Here we have polyethylene with a lot of branch molecules, therefore lamella structures are shorter. And this is polyethylene density 0.87, this low density because the molecule is not uh, really uh, folded nicely in the, in the compact structures, also uh, even polyethylene 0.86, even smaller uh, density and smaller lamella uh, structures. Again, you see them preferably, uh, preferentially in the hybrid mode. You see the, in the amplitude modulation mode, the contrast is inferior. And what's happening, uh, most likely the tip in the hybrid mode provide more deformation, having higher force effect, and then you this tip penetrates an amorphous region between the individual uh, lamella, which is 10, 20 nanometers and wide, more strongly, and that gives you the contrast, and this high contrast helps you, for example, to overlay the content, the crystallinity of this, uh, in this material, just measuring or evaluating the area of occupied by lamella and amorphous uh, components. That's uh, raising the very important question about the related uh, tip force interaction in the amplitude modulation, which is resonant, and the hybrid, which is non-resonant mode. Uh, and we will uh, see that that issue is very important to, again, to have a very high contrast visualization with the hybrid mode. Again, it was unexpected for me, but in the objects with the linear molecular macromolecular brushes with a long side chain. The, the cartoon showing in the right top corner, you see you have a core of the molecule and then side, a long side chains forming kind of brush type of macromolecule. Again, if you compare the images on the same locations uh, obtained in different modes, you see that only the hybrid mode height images showing really the whole structure of these objects where you have a core, you have the uh, core is as small as it can be as a, this 400 nanometer image on side, showing the core is down to a few nanometers. But you also see that uh, along this core there are these brushes, which is formed by the long side chains. And whenever I have done with amplitude modulation mode, I cannot get that. The hybrid mode is coming. And if you compare the height profiles in these two modes, you see uh, this here uh, taken along the dotted lines, you see that indeed, in a hybrid mode, we have a stronger depression. But in this case, this force is really giving a very positive effect. We start to see the structures more distinctively. And it's interesting well, it was also to look what happened if your chains become in shortest. Then, uh, this is the images for such macromolecules with the, uh, have linear uh, macromolecules with the shorter side chain and also um, uh, star shaped macromolecules. In both cases here, we don't see as clear the side chains, but in the adhesion images, both for the linear macromolecules and also for the star-like macromolecule, we see that the effects uh, bright uh, borders at the, uh, at the edges of the uh, macromolecules, and that's related to the short chains uh, of these objects. In phase and the height image of the amplitude modulation, the contrast inferior. And again, you see the comparison of the profiles, uh, height profiles showing that we have a stronger depression in the hybrid mode on this molecule. However, this depression was not dangerous because they recovered. And you can image this stuff first in the hybrid mode, then in amplitude modulation mode, and you see this kind of changes uh, uh, 
really not uh, not uh, permanent, and that's molecular recover. Uh, now we come into this point. What is actually the forces that with modulation in hybrid modes? We have this discussion on LinkedIn, I think, probably a year ago with uh, Steve Mini from uh, Brooker Company uh, about forces. They believe that not resonant modes can give you lower forces, and, and I was arguing that, and I now I will give you some. Uh, kind of consideration of that. Here, first, I will talk about this force of amplitude modulation mode. We have a, a Sergey Belikov colleague who has very, uh, very uh, developed in the sense of applying the mathematics and physics to the problems of the scanning probe microscopy, and this is his consideration of tip sample. Uh, forces and deformation, maximum force and maximum deformation in amplitude modulation mode. And this is the results uh, showing, we, I show uh, just the graphs showing how the maximum force and maximum deformation which calculated in the, uh, according to this path showing on the left, and there are some papers there, uh, in the uh, amplitude modulation mode, how it's realized on the particular low of, uh, soft probe, 0.5 Newton per meter, and on different samples with different models, they have different color finish curves. Interesting that you see that the uh, maximum deformation, maximum force on that, it's kind of reversed, depending on what kind of stiffness materials has, plus uh, the uh, value of, let's say, maximum force is going as, as low as around 100 pica Newton uh, for this particular mode. Again, if you take similar uh, Cancel when try to do the hybrid mode imaging because in this case again we have a more simple uh, formulation of the tip force and we see we can reach with the same 0.5 newton per meter probe 500 pica newton force and if you use which is not simple but in principle you can use 0.05 newton per meter probe and measure one nanometer deflection in that mode, and then you can get to the even to 50 pica newton forces. But that's showing that their bulk numbers very close, but it might not matter much because you forces are close, but the their action time, different frequencies, is different. Therefore, the effects on viscoelastic material can be very different. Therefore, we also done uh, some practical. Uh, evaluation of these forces in the uh, looking on the triblocker polymer SBS and the samples were prepared by either spin casting and the room temperature. In this case, top surface structures, these two images on the top, uh, actually reproduce uh, identically in the amplitude modulation and hybrid mode images which taken in the low force regimes for both. Then, if we take uh, the same material, but the film was prepared differently by hot spin casting, and then microphase separation was much stronger, and seen in the, in the top structure, we get the height images in amplitude modulation mode. That's really reflect the uh, top uh, topography of that star, of this material, because. Uh, Phase image of this is not showing here, but it doesn't show features showing that you really have operated very low forces. In the hybrid mode, is the same probe. I cannot get the same pattern. The pattern actually reversed. If you see the structure inside this uh, circle, which is uh, marked on these images, but it's very important to see that even there is no much uh, contrast in the stiffness map and adhesion map, there are local variation. And I believe that adhesion variation is, is translated or transferred to the uh, height profile, the hybrid mode, and make that represent the topography in a false way. Therefore, my uh, opinion that then if you work on the, uh, try to do correct profiling of soft structures, you might be uh, still much better with amplitude modulation mode compared to the hybrid mode. But hybrid mode has, as I show, its own advantages, and we continue with these advantages. And we will go uh, to the uh, maps of stiffness and adhesion, which you can get from this uh, deflection profile. Now we will consider the polydiethylsiloxane material. You see there are some references done long time ago when I was still working for different companies, but that show 
this material, they have the lamella aggregate inside of amorphous material. This is kind of mesomorphic polymer. And this aggregates, as images on the top show, they are nicely seen in amplitude modulation mode, particularly in the phase imaging. And at that time, and, and up to now, the phase imaging, one of the kind of well-established technique for looking on the morphology of uh, a heterogeneous polymer system. However, the phase, as Virgil uh, important uh, already mentioned, it's related more to some kind of energy-related uh, variations. It doesn't really translate it into individual uh, mechanical properties. It's possible to do, but it's rather difficult. Uh, in the case, so therefore, there are some advantages doing the same samples with a hybrid mode. Because then you have adhesion and stiffness map. It means you already differentiate local mechanical properties at those uh, two components. Even in this case, if you look on the height images, the contrast is slightly different than height in the amplitude modulation, and it's already shown that probably the extensive force make the uh, more dense structures more visible in this case. Now. Of course, we want to verify the value of adhesion and stiffness mapping in the hybrid mode, and we've done a series of binary composition, mostly on the polymers, and few of them I will show here. There are two important uh, things. First, if you look on the blends of polystyrene and polybutadiene, just on the top and the middle, polystyrene with Albert P, we see that there is a lot of uh, uh, binary contrast in the adhesion and stiffness uh, maps, and that's really reflect the variation of the uh, elastic modulus uh, in this, and, and also in adhesion in these materials. However, if you look uh, on the blend polyethylene uh, 0.86, this is branched one, and polybutadiene, if you look on the table, the elastic modulus quite the same, but in stiffness map, uh, on the bottom right image, you see that there are pretty nice contrasts. Plus, also in LDPE domains and in the polyethylene domains, the way it's lamella structure, you see these ele elements at higher resolution. And in the case of polyethylene 86 with polybutadiene, we know that the darker regions full of lamella structures, they can be assigned to the uh, polyethylene. The Issue is different here because we see more or less the same elastic models for the system, but well uh, defined contrast in stiffness. Where it coming from? I think here we come into very important and unanswered question in the IFM measurements of uh, particular polymers regarding viscoelasticity because polybutadiene it has tangent. Tan uh, tangent delta, which characterizes viscoelasticity behavior of the material, much higher, three times higher than for the polyethylene O86. Therefore, the contrast variation, what we see is stiffness, might also be related to the viscoelasticity behavior. And unfortunately, so far there are efforts, but we have not yet come to well established procedures to get this kind of contrast in IFM images, and 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 uh, we believe that hybrid mode is most suitable to do so. And I think in the next webinar, I will be happy to show results which confirming our expectation. But as Virgil mentioned, you never know what's happening when you're looking for new things. Uh, now, you see, we make first step. In using hybrid mode, getting the stiffness and, and adhesion maps, we coming in the first step in nanomechanical analysis. Of course, we want that to be in the numbers. However, it's not so simple. And the, the, I will put now this issue. I'll bring this issue to you. First of all, we, of course, there was doing this non-intention measurements as IFM-based and, and do it quantitatively. And the examples, uh, how this measurement done on rubber materials are given in the top part of the slides. You see this PDMS rubbers, they have different rubbers depending what size of the, of the chain between the joints in these rubbery networks. If you look on the left, on the flexion curves, you see different colors, this loading and unloading cycles, they're pretty matched to each other. Also on the right, if you do that on one of the sample different location, you see and get pretty nice consistency. This is statistically good uh, data. And this data, which uh, actually reflect the elastic response 
of this material can be analyzed with some of the models. And there are several models uh, which uh, consider the conservative deformation in these uh, polymer materials is Hertz, Needham, JKR, and DMT. We use DMT and then we get these numbers from this curve uh, which are put in the table together with uh, macro numbers and we have a very good consistency. However, rubbers is only one and not the most uh, uh, most popular, most common type of the polymer materials. Polymers are very, very broad in their properties and in the use. And then if we look on the bottom, the deflection versus distance curves, which we have taken in hybrid mode on polystyrene poly butadiene blend. These curves can be synthesized from the deflection profile and the uh, distance changes profile which we measure in the cycles of the hybrid mode. And here the data obtained on the different location in the blend. On polystyrene on the left we see that loading and loading uh, curves, especially in this repulsive part, they coincide, and this is an indication of elastic response. In case of polybutadiene, there is not such coincidence, and these variations, I think, uh, most likely reflect to the risk elastic behavior of this polybutadiene. Again, tangent delta of uh, polystyrene much, much smaller compared to polybutadiene. It means if you do imaging of the blend and you get in the numbers, I think there is no way you can get the true numbers quantitative using the same model, which is same elastic model. So far we don't have well uh, established mo uh, dissipative models which can describe the deformation. Therefore, the problem to make this really true quantitative or QNM uh, analysis is in development of dissipative model and then in adaptive uh, application this model where you do scanning uh, in real time, let's say in hybrid mode and getting the quantitative data. And that's kind of, I think it's our future. Now I will uh, come to another point uh, telling that the hybrid mode is useful, but it's not uh, solving all the problems as I already mentioned. But combination of these two modes is really, really good basis to do the comprehensive IFM analysis uh, and what we now uh, implement these modes in our microscope for the same purpose. I give you a couple of examples of that. Then first the studies of the uh, bismuth uh, tin alloy is a known uh, compound which used for soldering. And if you prepare the samples and looks with a hybrid mode, it's very interesting because it shows that we can do stiffness and adhesion maps on material which are much harder than poly, uh, polymers. Polymers do not uh, generally have the elastic models over 10 gigapascal. Here we have bismuth 50 and tin uh, 30 to gigapascal. That means if you're using very stiff probe and in hybrid mode, we can get the images uh, which show in here on the top. Height profile show there are a lot of crystalline domains, but stiffness show that the domains are of two kinds. And the brighter we assign to stiffer uh, bismuth domains where the uh, darker one can be assigned to the softer tin. Actually, with the same location with different tip, conductive, softer, can be done and we can do amplitude modulation with single pass KFMPM measurements. And it's very interesting that the pattern in surface potential is identical to one in the stiffness. And, but in this case, it reflects differences in the work function of the bismuth and tin. That's one example. And the second example is, again, we are coming back to the fluoroalkanes on the uh, graphite. And again, the same location done first in the hybrid mode, and we get maps of adhesion and stiffness of this domain and uh, self-assemblies, which is bright, and also areas around this is lamella uh, of the fluoroalkanes. The same location was done in amplitude modulation with single pass uh, KFM PM mode. And in this case, we have information about surface potential and DC DZ. So the contrast, you can say, look quite similar in all of these modes. But if you take some really close look on that, on for example, on the profile along this dotted bright line shown in these images, and there are this uh, related profile on the, on the on the right, you see that there are some specific variation 
in adhesion, stiffness, surface potential, and DCDZ variations. And uh, as regarding the CDZ maps, they can be very useful for quantitative electric measurements. And if you're interested in how you can calculate the electric permittivity with the DCDZ maps, you can look on our paper which was uh, recently published. Now I'm coming to the summary. I introduced the hybrid mode and it showed that this mode Indeed, useful. It offers advanced visualization on scale structures, which I show in the case of the uh, polyethylene lamella structures, in the case of the single molecules, this brushed uh, macromolecules. And uh, that can be used also for long distance measurements, can, but it's more useful for measurements even local adhesive and stiffness responses in the range, broad range of materials. That's, there is no doubt, this is useful mode. Second, we still need to work on dissipative model, then, and in order to describe the time-dependent mechanical behavior, a lot of samples. And that will open the path to true quantitative nanomechanical analysis. It should be models developed, and it should be adaptively applied to the, to the imaging, real-time imaging in the hybrid mode as well. Again, hybrid mode cannot solve all problems by itself, but in the concept with other resonance modes, like amplitude modulation related to single pass techniques, we, uh, this application can really provide the, the grounds for the comprehensive nanoscale analysis of this material. Now I'm uh, coming to acknowledgement uh, slide. Also, i like to thank you for all for attention, and I'm uh, I think giving Craig uh, microphone, and I'm happy to answer some questions if you have. We can do it also afterwards uh, online as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. If you have uh, specific questions, you may type them in the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen either in the question dialog box or in the chat dialog box. Um, we have a couple questions that uh, were raised during the webinar, and um, I will turn this over for, uh, in this case, Sergey to answer these questions. We'd also be happy to take questions uh, for Virgil Ealings as well. Um, the first question is related to the uh, stiffness map, and the question is, does the contrast in the stiffness map depend on the applied force? And if you use a low force, does that lower the contrast in the image? The answer will be yes, yes, and elevated forces in hybrid mode is actually in favor of getting higher contrast on the stiffness and adhesion maps because uh, that's actually uh, the key stuff. That means uh, you would need to optimize your measurements in the hybrid mode, particularly if you want to get the, the high contrast. Plus, by varying the ratio, you can go from one type of deformation. Let's say on polystyrene, you can do what I show you, very small level of the set point deflection. Then you have elastic response. If you increase that level much higher, then you can go to the uh, dissipative response. And then, in this case, of course, you get in the information, but you need also to use a very different model to analyze this data. It means it's, it's, we cannot just do images in one level and get all the information. Of course, we still need to do more comprehensive uh, experiment, experiments and then uh, related analysis of the data to have a reliable and reproducible stuff. No, no doubt, still the variation of the forces uh, by changing the set point deflection is very useful options for the hybrid mode as well as for other modes. Okay, there's another question in terms of how does the hybrid mode differ from uh, force volume and some of the other modes that uh, collect and map 
Oh, properties. I think generally they are addressing the same issue. We want to get local uh, mechanical responses compared to force volume. We are with the higher data acquisition stuff. We want to do it faster. Uh, faster it useful to do because it's just saving your time, but also for doing a different frequency compared to force volume, it can be very important if we can uh, differentiate the responses of viscoelastic material because force volume typically is uh, around one hertz, maybe 0.1 to 10 hertz uh, deformation uh, events happening. Here we can go to kilohertz, also there is no much reason we can expand to the other frequencies. And I think that's kind of complement each other, but the advantage, this, can, I will say this, uh, all this high data acquisition electronics, which also uh, fast real time processing, we can do now processing at, at rates like uh, around 120 megahertz, where we can filter, we can do an online, we can even do primitive calculation, we can collect the different parts of the uh, of this uh, deflection uh, cycle or deflection profile that we can put that in different images. And that's give you vast of the new information about the different local properties of this stuff. And I, and, and I mentioned there are other people, other companies who are trying to get that. Uh, to do the same because the main issue to get read about strong uh, destructive interaction, which is a shearing force, uh, going to intermittent contact, then also to use the fact that the deflection of the cantilever is more directly related to the forces than uh, amplitude uh, phase or frequency of, of, uh, of resonance mode, which can also be used to calculate or to extract the uh, forces from that, but it's much more difficult procedures than we know from the other uh, type of modes. Anyhow, I think this is just the step and, but we might see a lot of different things. We, again, we need to show, to follow what Virgil suggests us to, to do our things if we, uh, new things and, and, and do it with open eyes because we might find something we do not expect at all. Thank you, Sergey. I will combine a couple of questions for Sergey to answer um, uh, together, and they're related to: Can you do hybrid mode and liquid? Um, what are your typical spring constants and uh, scan rates? And have you examined the lateral stress strain during the contact portion of the hybrid mode? So these are all around the actual mechanics of the practical application of the hybrid mode. Yes, I think this is a good question and, and I appreciate that. Of course, it's on our agenda. Of course, we uh, have a means also to look at the lateral response, if we be, even if we believe that the lateral force should be minimal, but we should look on them. And in the software, we, in the working, uh, we can look also on the lateral components of the responses. Uh, and as regarding liquids, yes, we do this in liquids. Uh, that's one of these uh, kind of complicated uh, deflection profile I'll show you with the uh, hydrodynamic uh, kind of sine wave on the deflection profile that is common for, for liquid. We working on that to overcome that by filtering or by using special cantilevers because also the response of the cantilever in liquid when you approach and you're pushing uh, a, a layer of water as it's transferred and uh, the water motion to the cantilever. Therefore, yes, we're working on that spring constant. We're working with very small spring constants, also with different shapes. Uh, I think the range of the, of the props you can apply in different media for different is very, very broad. We're using props, let's say, starting with uh, below 0.1. Newton per meter, that's, of course, you better to have a smaller props and it's more, less hydrodynamic interaction. 
to using the probes uh, with the stiffness up to, I don't know, 500 Newton per meter, even, even and higher, to go to the, on, on the samples like bismuth tin alloy, which is the metals, and, and we can go to the higher. Of course, in many cases, we also worry about the tip shape, because also, uh, and that's also not related on the hybrid, also related to the, let's say, electric measurement, single contact mode. We can use smaller, uh, sharper tips for higher resolution, but for some properties, better to use bigger tips with modified geometry, particular for nanomechanics, you see, I show some good results obtained as a quantum nano, uh, IFM based nanotation, but there also I did mention that still a lot of work should be done to calculate this optical sensitivity, calculate the uh, real spring constant of the uh, probe, also to know the shape of the of the tube because that's very important to get a reliable number and and that's for this case let's say sm images may be very helpful and bigger tips will be most helpful that's all these questions we actually uh, a few days from now we will uh, post uh, the um, application note about the which you have more details about this measurement i mentioned today but also we very actively working in this field and all these questions we try to to answer in more details in the future. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, one of the questions is related around the choice of the nanomechanical models. The question is specific to the PDMS samples. Why was the DMT model chosen uh, with a sample that has such high adhesion as opposed to the JKR model? Uh, that's a good question. I actually don't remember much details about that because that actually work on Q&M was originated still I was at uh, working at the Vika Instruments. Uh, let's say I was a Sergey Berikov as well, and then we apply different models. We found the DMT is easier to apply in many cases. That's why uh, some of our friends using the non-resonance mode using that. Uh, but uh, because JKR need, I think more more, more calculation. It's more difficult to apply. That's I think the because DMT is actually it's linear combination of hertz and adhesion. That's why it's simple but it's not necessary most correct one. And I don't think it has broad applicability. It can be applied for rubbers. It can be applied for some, let's say if polystyrene, if you do very small elastic type of deformation, if you go stronger one, you will see dissipation. And then uh, you have, sorry, you have no right to apply that uh, because it's uh, it's strictly elastic deformation model. and, and uh, the fact that there is no other cannot justify this application and, and pushing the data. I think it's it's a little bit too much. Okay, I, our last question that we will have is uh, actually I'll combine a couple of questions into our last one that are related to one another. Um, the first part is does hybrid mode versus standard amplitude modulation mode um, wear out the tips faster um, and uh, an explanation of the differences on the tip interaction with the sample as well as there are several questions to compare and contrast hybrid mode to uh, pulse force, peak force, and jumping mode, the other modes that you mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation. So, Sergey, you could answer about the tip wear between the two different Yeah, devices. that's that's a good and important question because even if Virgil was mentioning this tip wear in STM was, was puzzling. And of course, we don't like that to happen, but uh, we cannot really have much control about that. What I can tell you that uh, a lot of things with the tip safety is related to the uh, engagement procedure. You can do that. We try, uh, in our case, we didn't, let's say, see extensive varying or more extensive varying on the hybrid mode compared to the uh, 
amplitude modulation mode, but it might be related to the way we do experiments because we first we're very very careful with engagement. You see, we do engagement in a very specific way in amplitude modulation mode. We going uh, first we uh, approaching the cantilever uh, the tip close to the surface when the uh, free amplitude just damping, let's say, to 10% from initial value, and then we're switching, we're switching off the motor and do just sewing process using only uh, the piezo and using only motor steps in the top part of the, uh, when the cantilever is further away from the, from the sample. In this way, and we, what we're watching, we're watching the phase signal, because when you approaching the surface, then the phase reacts much more abruptly to tip coming in intermittent contact with the sample. And that helps us to save the sharpness of the tip. And, and this, this is and how we do hybrid mode. We also do engagement, at least uh, in air, we do engagement in amplitude modulation mode and then uh, disconnect feedback in the amplitude modulation mode, switching modes, and then we uh, re-engage that or just dropping to the set point deflection from that situation. I think this helps us to eliminate this kind of uh, issue that tips may be damaged, not of the, because of the mode, but uh, because of the engagement procedure you're using. Therefore, we're very careful on that. Therefore, I can tell you that might be help us that we don't see much difference in the tip varying between these two different modes. And I think uh, situation a little bit difficult in, 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 in liquid, as I can tell you truth, but we're also finding now better way to engagement. Uh, in liquid, because even uh, some some more sophisticated measurement in contact mode, uh, then we can be applied and transferred to to the hybrid mode. And I think we uh, will uh, elaborate on this issue first in our application. But this is a very important question. Of course, we uh, worry about this. Yeah, but the comparing to modes, uh, yeah, let's say. If we do careful experiments in both modes, tip wear uh, is not a big issue. That means I don't see changing, let's say, if you can scan uh, the same area, let's say, 20 times. Sometimes I do that to verify the thermal drift in the particular modes. But uh, I don't see much difference between these uh, two different modes. But um, maybe my uh, experience with hybrid mode, which I'm probably working for the last what, half a year, maybe not enough to, to make more elaborate judgment of that, but uh, I will I will address this issue somewhere later. Okay, the last part, can you briefly compare and contrast hybrid mode versus the other modes that you mentioned? Yeah, earlier? that's <laughs> that's good question because the idea is the same in the sense to use the deflection for this, but uh, in order to compare, I need I need to look on the data obtained in the similar uh, and similar modes on the same samples, and uh, I don't have much uh, really practical results on that. I, you see, it's not easy to go and uh, to get imaging in, in a jumping mode with nanotech instruments or with the VTEC pulse force or with the Brooker uh, peak force. You just need to see it and do the samples side by side on two different instruments and see what, what you're getting. But that's, that's, that's it. We don't know what details what people are doing. The, the basic ideas more or less uh, similar, we need to use cantilever deflection, but how you you work with these particular signals, what you're doing is, is kind of, uh, it's, uh, for me it's not clear and I don't have this information to get the really fully justified answer, but uh, I think future will show and we we encourage our customers to, to, to run the same samples on the different systems side by side and, and then then we can we can discuss and we can get broader uh, understanding what's going on. Uh, 
Okay, that's all the time we have for questions today. If you ask a question online and it was not answered, uh, we will answer all of the questions that were asked and uh, provide written responses to those uh, by next week. Again, NTMDT would like to thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend our webinar today. Uh, we want to give a special thank you to Virgil Ealings for being available to give his perspectives on how some of the new modes uh, that are now common to us were developed in the early days. We hope you found the topics covered today interesting and the information useful. We hope to see you at future NTMDT webinars. As you exit the webinar, there's a short, short survey. Your feedback is very important to us, and it helps us to better refine and tailor our webinars to meet your needs in the most efficient manner. So if you would take 30 seconds to answer the survey, that would be great. I would like to thank everyone who attended and wish you all a great day.